Okay. Well, welcome to the <clears throat> to everybody uh, again, of course, and especially to uh, Jimena and Yolandi, who is, uh, I think, getting awake now in the in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> I think it's about four o'clock or five five o'clock. I don't know. It's now where we started at four. It's now nearly quarter to seven. So oh, okay, oh, that's a dark. Good it's getting light. The moon is up. Out that window there. Okay. Well, after the this morning, well, we started at twelve. Uh, the, the first part, <clears throat> which can be summarized, I think, as uh, something like the the mm, the skin of the landscape. How to make the skin of the landscape audible, and the other topic was the blanket of soil. So it's in the blanket <clears throat> and the skin or the, uh, how do you say that, uh, the, the guilty skin in a way. But that's just, just for me to, to remember the, 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 the both topics because there was said a lot of things. And we are now continuing the second part and I'm very happy that uh, everybody is now there so that we can start. And I will introduce <clears throat> you for, well, I have to do it two times for you, Jimena, because you are will also be uh, involved in the next conversation. But now uh, we start with Yolendi. Yolendi Harris is an artist and scholar engaged with sound, its image, and its role in relating humans and their technologies to the environment. Her artistic research projects consider techniques of navigation, sonification of data, sound worlds outside the human hearing range and underwater bioacoustics. They take the form of audiovisual installations and performances, instruments, walks, performative lectures and writings. And with regard to Jimena, Jimena Alarcon is a sound artist researcher focusing on listening to in between sonic spaces such as underground transport systems dreams in the context of human migration or what she calls sonic migrations. <clears throat> Jimena is an avid deep listener and did a PhD in music technology and innovation at the Montfort University in Leicester. Thanks to the Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellowship, she developed Intimal, an interface for relational listening and sonic migrations. And I thought also that Yolanda did a PhD at Leiden University. Yeah, if I'm not wrong. Okay, well, Yolanda, take the floor and then uh, Kimena will act accordingly. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Peter. Yes, so um, uh, this is my first words of the morning coming through Zoom. <laughs> my um, child is asleep next door. The moon is coming up. I'm in Santa Cruz, California. And the reason I begin with these things is this is part of the, the project, the, the, the difference in distance um, around the world. So I would like to share my screen and give a short presentation to you all. <clears throat> and we will go from here and then, and then I'll open this to discussion with Jimena. Okay, so. Polyphonic Landscapes, um, the first symposium. I begin with this image that is uh, a forest near where I am living now, um, a, mixed, just a mixed wood forest. And um, these are redwood trees that you see in the front that um, suffered a, a very significant fire, forest fire recently, two years ago. So you can see that they are very blackened trunks, but um, the forest is recovering, so you can see the underbrush is starting to, to revive. Uh, <clears throat> so if I could summarize it, my, my interest in these few words, how do we perceive um, one place as being augmented by another place? So what might augmentation be if you're in the Amstel Park and you are hearing perhaps sounds from where I am in Santa Cruz or the other way around. So I'm really interested in, in that sort of sense of augmentation of a place in terms of perception. 
So this is uh, from part of my proposal. Um, so I'm linking the Amstel Park in Amsterdam, which was my old home, to Santa Cruz in California, which is my current home, through sound. Um, I'm developing a series of sonic augmented reality walks. That's a nice little term, sonic augmented reality. We can talk about what that might be. Um, within the Amstel Park and an immersive video sound and digital installation at the um, Zone to Source exhibition space. So these two elements. Um, these forms will explore interconnections between our felt experience of a specific environment, connection to remote places, and the hopeful interspecies relationships built through attention to our sonic world. So that's sort of a quick summary of where I'm trying to trying to explore the areas I'm exploring in this. So it builds on uh, work that I've been doing over the last decade or so, or more actually since the PhD in Leiden. Um, and uh, I, I just want to give a very brief kind of uh, idea of where this comes from. One is underwater sound. One is an idea of listening to the ocean in the desert, and another idea is multi-species perspectives. So um, perspectives that are less human-centric. Yes, how do we get out of this human-centric kind of situation that we're in of perceiving the world? Um, the two recent publications, you may be interested um, to, to, to explore these. Uh, one is in the Italian journal Animot, um, and it is bilingual, so it's in Italian and in um, Italian, uh, sorry, <laughs> Italian and in English. And this piece was, um, how can I walk, swim, fly to the distance with you? And it's a conversation about uh, the work that I've been doing uh, with Roberta Perego. Um, so that's one, particularly focusing on um, the interspecies uh, sort of situation here. And then another one is in the journal Resonance, uh, the Journal of Sound and Culture. Um, this piece was called Sound is Round, a waterfall of falling sounds that I catch dreaming. And this was really about how we can expand our awareness of remote environments, um, sort of the, the physicality and um, um, uh, <clears throat> kind of tangibility of sound, the materiality of sound when you take it from um, deep ocean and listen back in places like um, the high desert in, in the South American Southwest. So these sort of relationships between sound as moving um, and material. So those are two um, sort of background writings. And then I want to, I want to go into some of the elements that, that are sort of building this research for me. So one is this idea of orientations and I, um, you know, I, I've been very interested in Sarah Ahmed's work on queer phenomenology and in, in, in her work on orientations. Mine takes a slightly different route, but um, I think that's a really interesting reference at this point. Um, so locating and orienting in multidimensional spaces. This is what's sort of emerging out of this work. How do we do this? And the multidimensional space is maybe the space that I'm in, the space that you're in, but also the space that happens between us and how we're, we're connecting through them. And that would be multidimensional. So here are some, here are some the terms, vertical, horizontal, yes? Um, how about in air, underwater, underground, different places that we have to learn to orientate, maybe. Um, the different kinds of orientation described as, for example, X, Y, Z or X, Y, Z, um, pitch, roll, yaw. You might be familiar with these terms in, um, in terms of accelerometers or these kind of sensors. Um, one, two, three, four in ambisonic sound or, or more. Yes, these channels. How, how does this these orientations work. So two areas that I've become interested in uh, more sort of technically, but as, as a way to engage with these ideas of orientation further, one is the idea of a drone using video as, from a drone. Um, I've always resisted for drones for many reasons, but recently I've become more interested in them. And um, one is the, the shift in perspective and how you can control this, this flying object, which has a remote eye on it um, with, you know, with these controllers. And the other is ambisonic sound, which is a very spatialized technique of using sound. Um, in both of those uh, techniques, there's this, uh, this, this sense, and I, this is um, just a, 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 you may see these things with ambisonic sound. It's like the interface that we use to edit the sound with. 
Um, and so this particular ambisonic soundtrack has four different tracks in different spaces from different microphones. And when I listen back and edit with them, I have this head um, from the top and the head from the side, and I can shift it around and it shows where the sound is coming from. And I'm trying to navigate this three-dimensional space on this two-dimensional screen um, that's happening over time. So we could say it's four-dimensional. Um, and, and somehow I'm having to map my perception of this very spatial temporal experience um, onto this, this interface, which has, you know, if it's the drone, it has these two little joysticks that you're, that you're mapping with. So um, this is kind of interested me, this sense of orientation in, in creating, creating work. Um, another question I have is, is how can this um, space be relocated and overlaid? So if I want to take my space from Santa Cruz, say my sounds or my images from Santa Cruz and overlay them in the Amstel Park, how can that, how can that happen? How can things be relocated? What happens during that relocation? And um, how could this, this sort of multidimensional space that I might capture with ambisonic sound or a drone video, how could that be relocated? And does it, does, how would it be overlaid in some way? So I have four different areas that I've sort of identified as places that I would like to start looking. I don't know how many of these will make them make their way into the final pieces, but final exhibition, but at the moment, these are kind of quite strong for my, in my mind. One is fog. And I'm interested in the idea of fog. There is a lot of fog here, um, and the redwoods survive by fog. Fog is interesting in that as the fog comes down, one's vision um, uh, is subdued and one's hearing is augmented. Yes, it, it's heightened. Mm -hmm. it, there's a sort of a parallel with these underwater spaces where the where the vision is you cannot see so far as um, as here into the distance. So fog is interesting to me. The tree um, with, with the redwood forest that are here, the tree offers this vertical idea. Mycelium offers ground as an idea of what is beneath the ground and what is connective tissue beneath the ground in relation to these other areas. And the ocean would offer something like flow. And I'm interested in how these, th these four things are, are connecting together. I mean, they're all interconnected. They're not separate zones, if you like. But um, so, so this is kind of my little framework. Just take a quick look at these. Um, fog, <clears throat> uh, I think of as sonocentric. Here's some images of fog around here. You can already see that the image, you know, our image is disappearing. It's very hard to take in photographs because the camera has nothing to focus on. This is very distinctive when you start to work in fog um, and, and the, 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 the heightened nature of the sound. Um, some, some more kind of sketch imagery. How do we even sort of grasp this idea of fog? A tree, um, and thinking uh, thanks to uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass and Susan Simard's Finding the Mother Tree, two books that have been very influential for me on this. Um, here the redwoods looking up, you get the sense of vertical, the, the size of these trees. Um, and here is more um, ideas, the root base that is often hollowed out. And this is um, fungi growing on a burnt black stump. You can see the blackness there. Um, <clears throat> myos mycocentric, so from the fungi's point of view, this is thanks to uh, Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life, where I first came across this notion of Mycocentric. I think it's a word that's quite that's, that wasn't coined by Merlin Sheldrake and it's used, but from the fungi's point of view, how do you how do you get to that place? Um, I explored some ways with um, John Cage's uh, mycological foray. Um, John Cage's work is collected his on mycology and his mushroom collection is collected in um, the UC Santa Cruz library here, special collection. So I've been working a little with that. Um, and this is another piece by Esther Pollock and Eva van Beckham, Dutch um, artists, grazing choreographies, and um, looking at these different notions and playing around with them in terms of a forest walk with uh, the electroacoustic music ensemble at the campus here and then exploring those ideas through performance and improvisation in different ways in the studio. <clears throat> uh, 
then oceanocentric. It's a, kind of a mouthful, isn't it? But I, I, I think it's an important way to think uh, from not from the land, but from the ocean. Um, I've been inspired by Alexis Pauline Gum's Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Um, really uh, wonderful perspective on, um, on the oceanics, oceanocentric kind of uh, viewpoint. So that here are some working ideas. Imagine an entwined sensory future of humans and ocean creatures where our attentive extended perception affects the world around us. <clears throat> How could that be? Um, an image of a, um, a white sided Pacific white sided dolphin that was stranded on a beach that I discovered in on the California coast um, and um, the, you see the scale between of, uh, the scale of the dolphin and the humans, and um, the kind of the different of the difference of these um, these media, the ocean and the land. So, a question that you know we talked a little, but Kimena and I have been talking a bit about is this idea of portals, and maybe this can start our conversation um, a little further, Kimena. Um, <clears throat> first is the woven. Soundwalk. This is a sort of a working title right now. The soundwalk part of this um, comes from these earlier pieces that I've made, which is in Dundee, using these braided headphones and hearing sounds of marine mammals in place um, as, as, as one looks over the ocean. Um, this is Dundee, and this is Melt Me Into the Ocean in Santa Cruz using um, underwater sound recordings. So, uh, and then there's this inside, there would be this inside portion of the exhibition, which would be the installation idea. Um, this was a recent one called From a Whale's Back, using videos taken from the tags on the backs of whales, and this kind of sense of being internal in an exhibition space, in, within an exhibition space or an environment, and the walks being something that you're walking through an environment. So this kind of complementary pair. Um, I wrote this, I can send you sound so you can walk with me through your place and mine. You can see the woven, <clears throat> you can see the weaving and hear the woven. It's a human connection, but across species to a kind of reciprocity between us. So I can give you a headphone set of rain on a tent in California, and you listen inside a glass gallery in a park in the Netherlands. I can give you headphones with ocean coasts and you listen from a bench overlooking the Amstel. I give you the sound of the birds at dawn in a redwood canyon, and you listen in an old monastery garden. I give you underwater voices of seals and whales, and you listen by the pond of the old seal enclosure. Uh, and what might you give me to listen here? Where would I choose to sit for your sounds? And in these strange juxtapositions, what would we notice? right up against this, our ears, this is woven. So here are some headphones that I've um, woven for this. I'm thinking of making more, I'm just experimenting with them at the moment. Um, and the last part that I would like to introduce before we could go to the discussion, Kimena, is this um, piece that I wrote uh, just a couple of days ago on, on vertigo, and I think that this might be interesting. So um, <clears throat> let's see, i get my Zoom windows out of the way so I can see something. <laughs> so um, thinking of vertical, we saw the vertical of the trees, uh, the idea of vertical uh, as uh, um, <clears throat> Vertical and grounded, so the, the, the tree rooted in the ground, the side of the vertical being rooted in the grounded, but vertigo would be kind of a loss of the ground, yeah? Um, so vertigo, uh, a sense of being unbound to the earth, of floating, of falling, of walking a few inches above the ground at risk of tumbling around me through the cultures I don't know and am not from, nothing to bond or anchor me to here. And so I float to the other side of the, of the world to ground myself, imagining my feet on the earth with others close, sensing, knowing a stable something, an exchange. Can I get this grounding without going back, experience it here to root in a place I don't belong with others who don't belong, 
or perhaps we can belong. Tree vertigo, when a tree leaves and finds themselves in another place halfway around the world, can they ground, root, or do they experience vertigo? Can they overcome the floating, falling sensation? How does the tree connect then? How do they return home or understand their culture? Do they just grow, reconnect, renew, grow into something else? Whale vertigo. And what about a whale? Perhaps it is less vertigo than compression, a pressing on all sides of a sound not their own, a crowding in a canyon underwater, a distortion of scale and place to something unrecognizable, their connections at great distances derailed, a swim, a swim like floating, like falling, no ground of culture destroyed from the roots. So those are the, the three ideas of vertigo and, and, and ideas coming out of this. Um, and we can, I'll stop my sharing there and go from there. Uh, thank you very much, Yolandi. It's uh, really a pleasure again to see your ideas. And after our conversations also last two weeks, um, I see now kind of uh, um, interesting, interesting kind of statements now <clears throat> that put together so, ma so many aspects. So I'm... I would like to go through some questions that I have before seeing that, seeing uh, today's presentation, and then to some that um, came now um, into a set of uh, uh, wonder and clarity um, uh, of how things might be. So one is about orientation and reorientation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which today actually expanded now with the last vertical ideas, not, not only to the human center orientation, but also to the whales, to the trees, to so that that's kind of a, actually augmented, <laughs> augmented reality of today's um, conversation. So when we when we orient, when we try to orient, particularly in, in my case, that is the context of, of migration, mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a discomfort about being detached. So the, the anxiety or the vertigo <laughs> is yeah. about looking for attachments, which we cannot get. So it's about sense of place. And this sense of place, it's, it has been really, um, kind of studied in a human-centered way um, and um, a sense of liberation probably or understanding is going into this in-betweenness um, uh, which is also dreamlike or augmented sonic or new layers where you get into a different sense of reality that the reality that has been fixed by culture by land by language. So I wonder in this that I already, I'm imagining more like being in your art uh, uh, space, like, okay, with these headphones and that there will be a sense of detachment perhaps. Um, so I wonder, what do you think in terms of attachments and detachments that are this sense, uh, um, uh, linked to sense of, of place, um, how what you are offering uh, that is an augmented reality, um, how that will create, what, what, the, what this experience will bring in terms of attachments and detachments. I, I, thank you, Kamina. I really like this, um, this, this resonance around attachment and detachment, if you like, through sense of place, because there is, um, you know, this, and, and I, I think the vertigo idea is, is sort of trying to get to that and trying to get to the idea that, um, you know, other species can also experience this and are doing so. 
um, you know, due to due to humans, yeah. Um, and so it it seems to me that you know when you when you are in a place uh, in a in a well in we're using this term landscape in polyphonic landscapes. So let's use the term landscape just for now. Um, when you're in such a place, um, when, you know, physically will connect, psychologically, you try to connect, you 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 kind of try to learn where you are and, and build a connection to it. And yet it can be so um, sort of strange. That sense of detachment is, is there because... Um, it's new to you in some way. However, how, and it seems, however long you tr long you're in a place, it still remains new, as if there's a reference to some other place that might not be new to you, even though you haven't been there, or maybe you weren't even born there. You know, there's this very strange sense of kind of whatever that belonging might be that that doesn't even have any any relevance anymore because you don't belong there anymore. But mm -hmm. You, so so how how do you how do you how are you within a, a place yeah and I I mean I experience this regularly um here in, in in living here in this part of the world and I think I have throughout my life as you know somebody who's moved away from my culture from a very young age and you know in different languages and in different different um, situations so you know I suppose there's a, a desire on my part to kind of to bring that out in this in this work and not um not hide it or solve it or you know so but just to let others experience that that that's very um okay yeah <laughs> you know that 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 these detachments can be overlaid in a way that that is a is a an experience that's worth having yeah and not, not worth solving or, you know, all these things. And, and clearly our, our time in, in over the last years during the pandemic, when many of us have had these very challenging experiences of, of you know, losing a loved one the other side of the world, for example, and not being able to be there with them or with the people around them. And how, um, you know, how, how do you feel connection to a place like that and to the people um, at a distance and and on some level there can still be connection so I, I'm just very interested in this and you know um, and I was really happy to see um, Buradice's uh, presentation at the beginning you know bringing up and naming this this colonial history in in, in the Netherlands um, because I think I think that it's a it's a historical multi-generational issue that's been going on that is sort of needing needing voice in a way to experience orientations or perspectives from from um, situations that aren't from within the culture yes within this dominant culture but that um, many people are having experiences of this detachment and so I think that's part of uh, of what I'm exploring um, in a way yeah. yeah thank you very much um another um aspect i would like to to go into is the role of augmentation mm -hmm. um when we augment something just let's say um visually could be could be if we augment something visually there is other thing that diminishes Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if, uh, with that in mind, in, in terms of sound, when we are the augmented this this sense of reality through sound, or the main medium sound, although there are so many senses around <laughs> there, but um, what do you think it it might diminish? If so, or maybe sound has a, a, is a material that that probably works in, in different terms with this uh, idea of augmenting and diminishing. Yeah, <laughs> Just because yeah. of using this word of augmented reality, which yeah. I don't know if it's coming from the visual technologies. Right, right, right. So, um, so I, I think this is where that idea of fog is interesting to me. Yeah. Because, 
you know, fog is, is, a, is it seems to be a substance and yet it's, it's so insubstantial, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like the ocean coming over land. It feels like it, it, it should have some, um, some pressure as you walk through it, but it doesn't, you know, it has this, this very strange, it, it, so it shifts the, um, shifts the senses and how you orient and move through the space. So I, I find, I, I find that a really interesting um, idea. And I, you know, the way I think of sound is that when you, um, you know, play around with sound as, as one of the perceptions and kind of heighten it in different ways, it's always in relation to the other senses. It's not, it's not, you know, devoid of those. So it shifts your perception, your visual perception, it shifts your proprioception, yeah, how you're moving, um, how you experience balance, um, these kind of things um, are, it, it can, it, instead of paying attention to the sound in itself, you tend to pay attention to that change. So, you know, oh, my balance is off, yeah. Or, um, you know, oh, I see something, I see that really differently now, yeah. So it, it's altering how you're perceiving things, um, even if you're not, saying oh I hear this particular kind of sound it can be a way this is how I like to work with it a way that shifts um your your other senses the perception of your other senses yeah I I found that the fog is an incredible example for that today I like that um idea because uh, because it 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 diminishes um, the visual, <laughs> yeah. But not necessarily. Um, it it does a different thing in, in perception with with sound. So it's it's very interesting to explore these these four aspects through the ocean, um, through the fog, through the trees that have very kind of visual. Um, a statement like the verticality of um, of the tree, <laughs> but how do you work in that sense with the sound? And also because I'm imagining, and that's something we talk about, and I I don't expect that you have it super developed, but is is the interaction with that because the the body will be probably moving. Um, so. One, one part is the perception of the body, like the verticality of the body or, or how I embodied the place and uh, the other elements such as the tree, such as the fog, et cetera. So that, that would be really interesting to know how do you build from these beautiful metaphors that are poetic metaphors into something that becomes sometimes hard, which is technology. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how, how do you imagine if you have some advancements in, in this part, in the possible implementation of, of this? How, how would you like to play with that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's still early. Um, I have some different ideas and, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm picking up on a word that you used uh, that technology is hard. And I'm wondering if you mean, what exactly you mean by that? If you mean- Probably control, as hard to control or hard to, control. Or, or, or hard to translate sometimes a certain poetic uh, imagination that we have as, as your images or as the poetry, the words into a managing um, this orientation x y and z for example yeah got it got it see yeah. I, I also i also like the picked up on that word because of its materiality you know the the you know i'm, I'm looking at your headphones i mean here are my <laughs> Yeah, you know, they are. You have the, the way. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then we were talking about, right. We were talking about um, uh, we were talking about fog being the opposite of that. Something that's um, mm -hmm. you can put your hand through. You know. Yeah. Um, and um, <clears throat> I mean, in the end, the technology is not something that I will foreground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will hopefully be something that is simple enough that it will be um, 
easily transferred to somebody to use and that will be that. Okay. So um, I, I'm very interested in trying to um, have, to understand these experiences that perhaps these different technologies like augmented reality or virtual reality or things like that may be trying to enable us, you know, something people always talk about the idea of the new, oh, it's so new. And I, and I don't, I don't really think of things as new. I prefer to think of things as kind of cyclical or uh, indifferent, you know, not this like progress um, story that we have. And so in, if that's the case, then, you know, the, the technology is would be something that um, enables us to experience it and not much more. So we have to do the work, really. Um, so if there are headphones, it would be um, really just as a functional way to get that 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 sound to your ears, <laughs> literally like that, and as comfortable as possible. And so that's one of the reasons, and the same with the installation, that it would be something that you're in, not that you have to put on or manually explore or play around with or anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things with these headphones is that, you know, if someone puts them on this um, and is walking around with headphones that might look like this, I don't know if I use these particular ones, but um, then they are also a sort of a visual um marker it within the park to other people i don't know why why are there people with those headphones on yeah what are they doing what are they listening to so they become something um that it's not just about focusing in on a particular interface that i'm trying to understand how it works and make it work mm -hmm. it, the attention then would be uh, much more outward um it, it, in the place I'm I mean I want people to be listening and focusing on, and like what we were saying kind of re-seeing the park in a different way mm -hmm. so moving through it without looking down at a screen or um, thinking oh can I play the next track or you know these kind of things I don't I don't want that stuff in there I'd like it to be mm -hmm. as seamless in a way kind of overlaid okay Okay, and in that, um, uh, imagining that um, uh, installation, uh, let's go to the idea of portal and expand really? on that, that you also wanted to, to start actually the conversations with portal. Um, uh, so going back to this kind of um, detachment and transition, because to detach, we need to be attached. <laughs> and and yeah. to and in the process there is a transition and this yeah. is th these are kind of the images or the processes that came to me when I was reading your proposal um, of um, the audio and the visual or the audio visual and how you were talking about a portal uh, between the installation and the sound walks that people will experience. Um, and then we were talking a bit of the portal, what is a portal? And actually portal is a very interesting word because it has kind of many connotations and uses. So I, I would love to hear more uh, explorations for the portal in, in, in ideas, but also in um, a oralization and imagination of the installation itself. Yeah, so I mean, this word sort of popped up to me a, a little while back, and and there's something a little awkward about it for me because there's, you know, there are so many references to what a portal might be, um, whether it's a <clears throat> sci-fi reference, and you know, going through a portal into another world, or a, um, a kind of a new age reference, a spiritualist reference, which could also be a similar thing, or um, or a very uh, technical one through a website. Oh, it's a portal <laughs> through my healthcare provider or whatever it is that you have to go through. You know, this word, it, 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 it's kind of got an awkwardness to it that I, that intrigues me, I guess. Um, and I can't think of a better word to describe really what I'm, what I, what is in my mind, what I'm trying to think through. That's why I brought it up to you and, and I was like, 
Jimena, what what do we do with this word portal? Because I feel like this is what it is. And thinking in in my mind, I think oh, so. I, I'm imagining because I haven't been to the Amstel Park yet, so I am still in the phase of imagining myself there through as much research as I can, through, um, you know, really wonderful videos that others, other members of this research project have taken for me, sound recordings that they've taken for me. So I've done these virtual walks and, and, and various things like that. But I, so my portal to that place so far has been through my laptop. Yeah, through, but also through other people's cameras and microphones and their positionality within the place, the space and, you know, how, you know, even up to their, their conversations, casual conversations with other people while they're walking through these different things um, are my, have been so far my, my way in, it's almost like I'm looking through someone else's eyes or listening through someone else's ears, as I go into the park and my relation to the park. And I think, there's something really interesting about that. There's um, so not like a, a portal could be a doorway, not something that's um, sort of purely physical, but really the idea of sort of moving through someone else's experience almost into another experience um, through the through the sound. So I I don't know exactly how I'm going to do this, but. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, there's a, and maybe maybe people won't won't quite experience it like that. But but I I mean the idea of augmentation is that these things these places are layered on top of each other. So the experience should be not like I'm going into an installation. Oh, it's all about Santa Cruz. That's great. But I'm going into an installation, and there's some reference. There's some relation between the sounds and images that I that I am experiencing in the installation and the place that I am actually in the Amstel. Yeah, so that those two things are not um, not separated, but they are um, that the, the, they're pulled together in some way. And so then the experience of going to your local city park could be that I go to the park. There is a tree from the other side of the world, for example. There happens to be a redwood tree in this park that was brought across, you know, during these these colonial times when they went around the world and brought back all sorts of different species, put them in these western parks, for example, and there they're growing. And I can sit by this and I can have a portal or some kind of experience of where this tree might have might otherwise grow. Yes. So that attachment detachment again. How can can I maybe I read too many fairy tales to my child? Can I transport myself via the tree to this other place? But you know, there's a there's a there's a through the sound. So I mean this requires a lot of willing participation, imaginative participation by the by the person listening. Mm -hmm. Um in a, a kind of listening that is not um that is not sort of analytical listening so much as experiential listening in a way. Mm. I wonder if the fog, the tree, the mycelium and the ocean are kind of part steering this portal. I mean, if uh, because when, when I first read it um, uh, last week, uh, your proposal I, I was thinking of actually of something physical I was thinking mm -hmm. actually of physical installation some some something but today I think that probably <laughs> this this fog tree mycelium ocean that have kind of um, an important um, suggestion I wouldn't say function but suggestion like you disconnect you have a vertical thing, you offer me ground, you offer me flow. So if that could help us also to go into that portal that is sonic more, it has a different material, that would be interesting to think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and um, probably have a, a space for just one last question, but it's about the audience and the, and the public um, and the, in in pre in previous you, uh, work that I read of the papers that you offer uh, me, um, there is an interest in, uh, interest of multi generational work with with people with the audience, yeah. And um, 
And also it distracts me also that you in, in your you, you mentioned a lot about your child. So you have very close this experience of childhood where I think is where our main attachments to place happen. Mm -hmm. because is where is the the street where we grew up uh, and of course you have different experience like oh, many people like growing probably in, in different places staying two years two years here two years there um, but uh, recently talking to someone who has experienced this kind of uh, dislocation uh, uh, was telling me that many people that he knows with the same experience in this moment, let's say in, in their mid age, uh, they try to go back to that place, mm -hmm. the place where, where there was some part of effect that was created, some part of emotion that always will be there, regardless all the places that we move. It could be um, music, it could be culture, food, and, and probably the tree where we used to play as, as children. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how are you planning to engage uh, people uh, in, in this work and if there is any interest of multi-generational uh, approach or invitation uh, for people to experience your work. Oh, thank you, Jimena. It's really, it's, it's really interesting. Um... To think, I mean, I'm very interested in um, sort of intergenerational trauma and the way it is passed down through the generations. It's something that I've been studying a lot and, and experiencing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that that is that's really a reality that affects all of us and our cultures in a very deep way. So there's a, you know, there's a lot a lot there and, and when I go to I mean you mentioned like a human experience if I if I explore the the marine mammals for example um, and think of how their cultures have been how they've been just destroyed devastated and the very few individuals that are, have been left there are stories like this uh, in, for humans we we know this like the indigenous Americans um, these these places where the the um, intergenerational trauma is so great and passed down. How do we engage with those things? So if I'm dealing with whale sound, for example, how do I engage with the sounds of these um, of these beings that have been so traumatized and so at the at the brink of of destruction? Through our own means, yeah, because what you know, what does what does that even mean? I mean, these are huge topics and huge questions. So I tend to go back, like you say, to the personal. So what is it like? What is the what is the experience of of being dislocated in so many ways, um, and and looking for that ground and trying constantly to find a ground, um, or being, um, you know, being comfortable in this sense of vertigo I don't know if you can ever be comfortable in it but, <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean I, just, I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly but um, I think it's a bigger discussion maybe to have but um, you know just to finish maybe I remember going back to where I grew up in the south on the south coast mm. of England and it was the trees because we're talking about trees the thing that was different was that the trees had grown they were so big and I was so confused because I had everything around me. I mean, my my whole body knew exactly the footsteps that I could take, um, you know, but that was all in my my physical memory. But um, the trees were different size. So um, it was something interesting there. Thanks a lot, Jalandi. I thank, thank you. you. It has been a thank pleasure. You. And, and uh, yes, I mean, all of that is to wish you the best um, in your project and uh, hopefully now we have time for questions. Hopefully, <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I, I try to, uh, yeah, now, now the video works, it didn't work. Thank you very much for, for this interesting <laughs> conversation with a lot of aspects. Uh, and that's that's the nice thing of the, <clears throat> the first exploration of, of research terrain in which you, uh, where to focus on and <clears throat> what kinds of things pop up. Um, but I think that, that there are 
the questions also in the audience to maybe also talk about a little bit about uh, transportality. That's where <laughs> that's where I was thinking of the, the, uh, the using of portals. It's so and and and, and transmission and <clears throat> things that change. I should like to see who is who likes to ask a question. It's your time now. Do I see Nele? Or are you clapping? <laughs> I, I see some. I mean, this work is really at the very beginnings in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I mean, we've been thinking and talking and, and uh, you know, working on this for some months now, but it's still um, at the at the early stages. So I'm open to any thoughts or questions or ideas. Who knows how it will finally end up? Mm -hmm. um, Sharon, I see your Sharon. hand up. Yeah. Hi, here I am again. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, I, I and I'm just I what I didn't really plan a question, but I really like the idea, the performativity that suddenly came out when if people are wearing these headphones, um, which create this um, <clears throat> sense of something's happening and moving around, and something's experience being experienced, and so I, yes, is there any other way that yeah this that you might. Um, use this idea of performativity um, as a, yeah, maybe an augmentation or as a way of sharing or connecting to others, to the environment? And would you like people to connect also with each other in that, in that way? Mm. Yes, because these tend to be kind of solitary experiences when you have a set of headphones on, they close you off to, to uh, what's around you uh, in a way. Um, I've noticed, so I showed you some images of the earlier works with other headphones that I've been, that was, I was doing, and those headphones were um, open back so that you can hear what's happening around you. You can have conversations with people. So the augmentation is really, you know, the, the two sounds on top of each other. And it's really about trying to psychologically and, you know, blend them together in some way. Um, so that's that enables conversation or some kind of um, being together. But the performativity, I mean, I if I call it a performance, I feel like the audience might get shy. <laughs> no, I mean, not necessarily shy. There will be some that love it. But, you know, it's more like it puts a burden on them to perform and to be watched. And I that I it seems more like it's a sort of an incidental um, thing that that I've noticed that people wearing these headphones when I do these walks, others will kind of look at them. So they are they might be a little self-conscious, but once you start seeing four or five people with those headphones on there and they're like, oh, something's going on. What is it? And then where do you go? Maybe you go and explore and find it. So I think maybe less of a performance than... Um, a sort of an indicator of something happening to do you see what I mean yeah thank you yes yeah, yeah I appreciate that it sounded fun and playful so <laughs> yeah it should be yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you I'll leave for for other people to have a chance hopefully to engage thanks thank you Sharon Somebody else. <clears throat> okay. We have a question by Buddha. Buddha, please. So, <clears throat> hi. Thanks for hi. the wonderful <laughs> sharing of your thoughts and and the project the beginning stage of the project i have been thinking about the term portal for a while and i was thinking help <laughs> what help good i'm glad 
No, for me, portal is like an entry point, like a window through which you can imagine or experience certain things that you'd like to, for example, observe or investigate. Mm -hmm. So for me, portal is not necessarily reduced to the website that through which you can enter into a, a, an augmented world, but portal often offers something that you can choose uh, also, for example, browsing or you can also refuse to enter a portal. So mm. this one and second question I was having is just, it was just a comment. The second question was about juxtaposition, like mm. an overlaying. When uh, we navigate a situated experience, for example, on a place in a, let's say we are crossing a traffic, we are wearing headphones and listening to something else there there is an overlay of sonic um you know sonic mm. sonics and and sometimes it's considered harmful when you are not situated enough to navigate for your orientation and often this kind of situations when you overlay sonic sonic experiences there is a um, i have experienced myself there is a kind of semantic fatigue that you are not giving attention to your being there and and then you are your mind in somewhere else it's some kind of absent mindedness so what is your comment about that i totally agree <laughs> i've experienced similar things um so again the 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 walks that i've been doing before have been dealing with that in with with these literally open back headphones so that you can hear both places at once so that you you have to engage with both levels of sound and how they're interacting with each other so it's not one cancelling the other out yeah so it's not replacing one sound um, with another sound and then trying to move through the world with a completely different space much like a film score yes yeah? so it, it your experience then is that you're moving through in a, in a movie and you you have a detachment to it or some kind of emotional engagement that it's different well that's an interesting experience but just as you say it 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 um it leads to this detachment or um you know and and i really <clears throat> the idea of the augmentation is that it's the two things on top of each other yeah um and that you have to sort of perceive both together so the the walks by the by the ocean here are underwater sound how do you how do you hear those underwater sounds while your feet are on the ground feet are on the earth yes um walking as a human moves generally apart from swimming yeah but um and hearing the sounds around of footsteps of people of the ocean waves of you know these things in combination with this other world of sound beneath the ocean now that's that I think is is interesting to me. Another point that I did want to mention is is the use of music, and I'm quite interested in uh, in other projects. I've sort of started to deal with this a little. How does you know we we tend to think of sound and music as something separate? There's some line where the, where you cross and you're in music and you're not in sound anymore. And I think I think the two are very interesting. Where one's mind shifts when um, a, a musical listening comes in um, and the sonic kind of attention shifts in some way um, and how to play with that as a way to bring people in and out of that state of um, of connection to place yeah I think I think that's a, an area that I'm going to try exploring a bit more Thank, thanks for the response you're welcome thanks for the question yeah, thank you. Thank you, Buddha. I think it's a good time uh, <clears throat> to close this conversation to, to enter the, the last one. But before we do that, we will take a five minute break. I think Alice has a question. Oh, sorry, Alice, I didn't see it. Uh, yes, I did, but it's a time. <laughs> but I just maybe could squeeze in uh, here because there were less questions. But um, 
Um, it can be a very short answer. answer. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear all the conversations and just listen. Uh, I, I just what really interested me, uh, Yolanda, also about thinking about this distance and spaces and how to experience this 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 uh, different landscapes in a way that are really far away. That uh, and you talk a lot about like uh, the fog and the sort of instability and unstable ground that we on and like what is place and how we find ourselves. But it seems to me there's also a real like environmental urgency that you're really talking about because it's so much right now if you think about like ecological crisis and this kind of global uh, uh, yeah problem we are all in together. It's so much about uh, somehow having to relate to all these places that are really far away that are influencing us yet they very far from our world or maybe places we've never set food in but that somehow have huge, huge impacts and that we somehow need to start comprehending um, which you don't do by looking at an abstract map or even a picture so it seems to me that it also really plays with like how how can we even have like a personal relationship or a connection or a, a like empathic uh, relation to a place that is so far away from us and I was just wondering if that also like that that's uh, again bringing things like closer in that way rather than just distancing it from itself if that also like yeah how that yeah, plays a role in, in in thinking through this yeah that was really my main motivation to start the project was how do how do I possibly understand what is happening it to the environments around the world if I cannot be in them or cannot perceive them in some way there must be a way that I can have a richer understanding of them and a richer connection to them without having to go without having to travel always you know this this passion for traveling to see to see things is is you know is such a privilege and such a destructive privilege I think in many ways that I I'm very interested in being able to to explore these connections, a deeper connections somehow with place at a distance. I think it's crucial. Um, so thank you for for bringing that up, Alice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great talk. <laughs> yeah.